Today on the Somewhere in the Skies podcast. United States Air Force veteran and former employee at both Area 51 and Skinwalker Ranch, Chris Bartell. This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. Chris, welcome for the very first time to Somewhere in the Skies. I appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me, having me on. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Now, you know, a lot of us have been keeping up with everything going on at Skinwalker Ranch as of late. Uh, you know, we've got the television show. The new owner has come out in the past few years um, to tell us about what's been going on. And we even learned that a government program funded the ranch for an amount of time which i know you're gonna have some stuff to say about uh as we get into it but um let's tell our viewers and listeners if you don't mind maybe a little about who you are and your connection to both skinwalker ranch and also uh the nevada testing site and and area 51 this is crazy when i heard that not only had you worked out at groom lake but you also worked at this mysterious ranch in Utah. You're like a UFO podcast's dream guest. <laughs> so yeah, man, give us the origin story if you don't mind. I guess right place, right time. I guess, but no, I um, I was born and raised in a um, small town in Kansas, and uh, basically when I got out of high school in '97, I joined the United States Air Force um, to be a security forces police officer. And uh, that led me down to uh, being stationed at Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas in 1998 as a main base police officer there. And I worked there uh, from 2000, from, from 1998 to 2006 active duty. And during that time, I was also a cadre instructor for GCTS, Ground Combat Training Squadron, up in Creech Air Force Base, uh, Nevada. And then in 2006 to 2009, I went to the IMA Reserves for the Air Force. And then in 2006 is when I actually got hired with the uh, Department of Energy for the Nevada test site. Um, and that kind of led me on the path. My, my reputation in the Air Force, it's, you know, Nellis Air Force Base is a very unique uh, base because obviously Nevada's got a lot of black world projects and stuff going on. So if you're working security or law enforcement out there, you kind of just kind of fall in line. There's other options. You know, you can work Metro Las Vegas or Northtown. PD or, you know, there's tons of different jobs, but I went down the DOE site because I had a lot of friends there. And that's who, that's who kind of got you in the doors. You kind of get vouched in like a friend's like, Hey, you should apply. And, and then, so I started working there at the Nevada test site for several years. And then my wife, who I met in the air force, she was also a police officer at Nellis and uh, she got orders to Maelstrom air force base. And so this is back in 2009, late 2009. So we, go to Maelstrom Air Force Base because she's from uh, Montana originally. So we thought this was a good move. Mm-hmm. And then we get to Maelstrom Air Force Base. And I don't know if you've ever been out there in Great Falls, Montana, but it's, it's almost as flat as Kansas. <laughs> yeah. But pretty bad. Still yeah. <laughs> good, yeah pretty, still some good folks out there. And we, we enjoyed our time out there, but she got pregnant with our first son and the Air Force was kind of downsizing at that time. So they gave her the option to get out, and she was like, hey, I don't want to be a military mom, always deployed, and never see my kid. And I'm like, hey, I get that, because as a cop in the Air Force, you're gone all the time. So I'm like, well, that means I could better roll the dice back to Vegas, because that's where all my connections are at. You know, I, I had a job lined up with the federal air mar- or for the federal um, marshal service in Montana, but this is in 2009, 2010, there was a federal hiring freeze. So then I started making phone calls back to Las Vegas. And um, the first person I called was my old Air Force supervisor. And I said, do you have any leads? You know, naturally, I was trying to go back to the Nevada test site. And he was like, uh, well, no, everything's on a hiring freeze. But he said, you might want to call this other guy who was another ex-Air Force supervisor who worked for uh, CSC, which had the contract for Air 51. So I call him up. And as I'm driving to Vegas, I get hired pretty much in route to Las Vegas with CSC for part-time work um, until a full-time job opened up because I still had an active queue clearance. So that was a big positive. So when I got to Las Vegas, 
I end up making some more phone calls, and then I reach another air, old Air Force buddy of mine who had this gig in Utah or for, for Bass. And I applied, and I or got the job, did the interview, and I was working both places at the same time. I was working for 51 part-time and then full-time for, for Bass. I needed a full-time job because I had a kid on the way. So that's kind of a long, roundabout way. And then um, – a full-time gig open with CSC for the Janet detail. And I worked out for a while and I actually quit bass for, I quit bass, went to CSC full-time to work the Janet detail. And then some pay issues came up and I was forced to kind of go back to my previous job at bass, that big oil space. And that's where I ended up. And I stayed there until I left in 2018. And then I came here to Kansas and I'm still currently a federal police officer out here. So that's kind wow, of long, man. long, long, drawn out question but that's the my career in a nutshell <laughs> it well it, it shows a dedication to um something you're clearly very good at to be hired by by places like this um two questions to kind of piggyback off of that if you don't mind yeah. um now for any of our listeners myself included um who aren't familiar with what a q clearance is now we know there are different levels of classification um what exactly is a Q clearance or what can you tell us, I guess, of what a Q clearance is? And um well, what was like a day to day working security out at Area 51 with Janet and everything? Well the Q first your first question, the Q clearance the Q clearance is kind of like just a DOE's version of a top secret clearance. It's got a little okay. more little more weight to a normal TS clearance, I guess, because you go through a very, very extensive background check and you go through a very extensive academy to be a police officer out there, security police officer out there. Um, so the washout rate's pretty high. So when you get a queue, it's like a golden ticket. You can pretty much go anywhere. And a lot of people, once they get their queue, they go right to the Pentagon. It's mm -hmm. a pretty easy transition because it's a very, it's like $20,000 to get a queue clearance. So if you have one, it's, it's beneficial to hire people who already have a clearance or can get one. So it's, so Q queue is just a version of the DOE's top secret, um, basically. Gotcha. Um, uh, the, the Jenna detail was basically you report down to the McCarran airport and you work the, the site there with some other guys and do it normally what you do at a security airport like TSA. And that's kind of all I can really say about that. But um, gotcha. yeah, so you know, the Nevada test site is a sister site to 51. They're right next to each other. They're like right next to each other. So 51 is in a very strategic location because you have Nevada test site, um, and then you have uh, Creech Air Force Base, Totem Paw Test Range, Nellis Air Force Base, you know, the natural surrounding ma mountains. It's a perfect location to have a facility like that, you know, and uh, it's all overlapping layers of security for basically one site. And the Nevada test site itself is the size of Rhode Island. That's how much area of responsibility you have out there. It's huge. A lot of, a lot of stuff out there. So um, with the test site, with the Nevada test site, you sign lots of NDAs going in and leaving that job. So there's not much really I can say about working for the Department of Energy and working out there at the uh, NTS. But I really enjoyed my time out there. And I have a lot of friends out there and had a lot of great experiences and was a part of a lot of special access programs out there and, and uh, a lot of projects. And it was a really eye-opener experience, you know. And, uh, you know, you think you do a lot of stuff for the DOD for the military and then you go into other organizations like doe and it's like a whole different ball game basically right yeah and i mean the doe is kind of that um that that carrot that's always dangling in front of the ufo people because we're like yeah. they're the only ones that don't answer you know for Sorry. like what they're doing and and it's understandable to an extent we we understand but um yeah because i, guess, I think yeah yeah please oh i think what and I get a little flack for this, but this is the reality of the situation here. It's like, um, you know, we want disclosure, and I'm for disclosure as well. But when you have a certain faction of people asking, like, for the, the government to release all the data or maybe expose technology that we have, and maybe it is alien. I don't know. I can't confirm that. But what you're really doing is you're jeopardizing national security to a point because, the overall objective for the United States Air Force and for the military industrial complex is air power global dominance. That's the, that's the overall objective. And that's how the United States keeps control and keeps ahead of our enemies because it boils down to war. You know, this mm -hmm. stuff boils down to war. And with that loss of lives and everything else that comes with war, all the ugly stuff. So the United States 
wants to be on the top edge of the the war fight fighting platform basically and so some of these locations like 51 or test site you know obviously this technology new technology is tested there so we can keep that edge so i'm all about having disclosure um, but also i think it's funny that people are still waiting for the government to give disclosure when it's the government that's been hiding disclosure for the last 70 years so who do we trust here this hand or, or this hand it's just like if you're waiting for the government to to release stuff good luck and then if they do release it is it going to be true data or is it going to be just a a whitewash narrative to drown out the truth so yeah. if, you're, if you're like you know somewhere in the skies you're, you're the name if you want to look for truth just go outside and observe the skies yourself and collect your own data you know, yeah, up. collect your own yeah. data and then don't wait for the government to, to, to tell you something. I mean, yeah, I get to a point where people are like, you know, I pay taxpayer money and I want to learn about this. And I, I totally understand that. But there's a different game being played here that people don't really fully understand. You need to take a step back and be like, okay, who are the people that are talking most about UAPs being threats and stuff? Have any of them served? Have any of them hold this help? hold a top secret clearance or work for a three letter agency. I don't really see many of them that, that do. So it's kind of like at the end of the day, where do you want to get your information from? Mm -hmm. It's better to go online and start making connections like with people like you and other investigators and, and, and putting the pieces together, you know, independently versus waiting for the government to hand out a silver platter. I, I'm not, I'm not holding my breath. I really, I'm really, I'm not. So yeah. And I'm kind of I'm kind of jaded a little bit because of where I used to work at. So when it comes to the right. whole UAP topic, I'm a little bit jaded, and I, it's just how it is. I can't con I can't control what's up in the skies as an investigator, but I can control what's on my on the feet on the ground, and that's what I focused on at Skinwalker Ranch when I got out there was to focus on what I can. What do I have direct access and control of? I can't control what's in the skies. I can observe it, but do I really know what's out there? Do I have the proper equipment or backing or or experts around to say yes or no. It's just, you have to really control what you can get your hands on. Yeah. Right. And you're, you're definitely transitioning into what I think the bulk of this conversation is going to be. And that is skinwalker ranch. I know a lot of our viewers and listeners are really excited to hear you talk about your experiences there, which we'll get to, we'll get there guys. Uh, yeah. But before we move on from that, Chris, I yeah. love, you know, with that, I guess, non-transparency or classification in national security that comes with things like uh, Nevada testing site and um, Area 51. When there's no transparency, that's when people start making things up. That's when people start creating rumors. And a mythology is born out of these places that you've worked at. So, right. I mean, what did you know about area 51 when you finally made it over there did you know about all this stuff bob lazar <laughs> was talking about and the ufos no, yeah what, what can you tell us that is hilarious that you bring that up because i was going through my stuff today I'm, I'm 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 trying to set my office up here and in, in, in my new office where i can display my photography and i was going mm -hmm. through some old books and i actually found this book that i bought back in 97 which was the Area 51 book this oh, is before wow. i joined the air force I read this book and I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. And then I joined the air force and then I ended up working at these locations. And I was like, wow, <laughs> talk about like projecting, you know, your future. Um, it was very strange. Now I'm, yeah. I, I, I'm honestly curious, you know, I'm, I, I love the UFO stuff. And I, I like the paranormal research. I like all that stuff. I've always, I've always been into it. So, um, this is something I never shared before. Um, when I first got to Nellis Air Force Base, uh, my first supervisor actually worked at 51. And this is back in 98. And I'll never forget, he had a Nokia cell phone, the one the flip, the old school flip phones one. Yeah. And I'd be, on, I'd be on patrol with him, and he would get a call on that cell phone, and he would be gone for weeks. And then he would call me up and say, hey, pick me up at McCarran Airport, and I'd go pick him up. And I would say, hey, you know... Um, you know, what, what happened? What were you at? He wouldn't say nothing. So uh, I won't say his name, but uh, long story short, we had, he, had a, he got orders to Korea Air Force Base. And this is back in 90, 98, 99. 
So we had this big going away party for him at the Deuce Five, which is across from Ellis Air Force Base. It's like a local military hangout. Mm -hmm. And uh, we get him pretty liquored up or whatever. And found there's a bunch of us young airmen that are around him, you know, and we all kind of knew he worked at 51. And finally, I asked him, I said, you know, can you tell us anything about your time out there? And he paused for a second and he said, the things I've seen out there, we won't lose an air to air war in a thousand years. And that's all he said. And I was just wow. like, what? And then that was it. And I was just like, wow. But he was like dead set when he said, when he said that, and this is a 98 remind you, he yeah. was dead serious when he said that. So it makes you wonder kind of like, okay, if there's technology that's out there, let's say the Tic Tac is some of that technology or whatever. You're looking at a situation where we might have technology that could replace the entire military fleet of aircraft. We're right. talking trillions of dollars of money that would be just gone. Like it'd be outdated aircraft replaced by some type of superior technology, you know, um, not saying a tic tac is that, but it just, it makes me wonder like, what if, what if that is our technology, you know, uh, but I also like to play on the fact that with the oceans, you know, what, what do we know about our own oceans here? You know, what if this technology comes deep from a different species within our earth's crust or whatever, and it's evolved into this, uh, hybrid uh, human oil where it has to come surface to refuel. I don't, I don't know, but it makes me wonder our own oceans would be a good starting point to look at as well. You know, I don't know. It's yeah. something that's always, I've always kind of been curious myself about what's really down in those ocean in the, in the deep ocean, you know, what's, yeah. what's our own earth, the secrets of our own earth, you know? Yep. Yeah. I, I, I tend to always uh, keep that in mind that, you know, we're so trained on the skies and yeah. what could be out in the outer reaches of space when, when we know so little about our very own planet. And I think you're right. right. There has to be some sort of um, reason um, logistically and mathematically, statistically, I guess, that so many UFO sightings occur over bodies of water or are right. at least reported that way, even in the military. Um, mm -hmm. And then you have places like, uh, I, I remember researching a place called uh, Autech, like this underground, or excuse me, underwater military installation that had like a restricted airspace that reached really? like the outer atmosphere, which is crazy to think like what could they be doing from underwater to the outer reaches of space what's being yeah. tested there flown there um it blows my yeah, mind but, man it really does but i i knew a little bit about bob lazar obviously i saw all the when i was uh at being working at nellis listening to the normal news i would see george knapp's uh, broadcast sometimes when he'd recap bob lazar's story and i was very intrigued and this is all before i've been working at these locations, you know, mm -hmm. my kind of plan when I was in the air force was to either stay in for 20 or get out and move back to Kansas or something. But I ended up staying in Las Vegas for 20 years and working some of these sites that led me down this rabbit hole basically. And, um, but yeah, I was intrigued by his story as well. And it made me, and actually working there, some things that Bob says makes total sense. I, I don't deny one bit that he's probably worth there, you know, but what projects and where only he would know that that's how the, that's kind of how that area works. It's overlapping layers of, of secrecy where me and you can work in the same location for 20 years, but we would neither, none of us would know what we're working on. It's just, yeah. it's just how it, that's how it's set up to keep the secrecy, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's definitely some truth to his stories. I, I would definitely believe, you know, I guess when it boils down, cause I always get people online that ask me questions, you know, what do you think of this person? What do you think of that person? And unless I meet them in person, I really don't know what to say because it's like, if you want to judge somebody's credibility, judge the person's character. If their character is mm -hmm. flawed and you're working in these type of career, uh, these areas, there might be some, some questions that would arise. Like, are they being truthful? You know, what's, yeah. what's the real objective here? What's the narrative they're trying to push? I mean, Bob's story has been pretty much the same the whole, the whole time. So, um, yeah, I would like to do a face to face with them maybe one day and, and just talk or, and that'd just, be cool. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be kind of cool, you know, but I mean, I don't know. It definitely has, hey, uh, we can, we'll tell. yeah. Well, I mean, kind of, I guess playing off of that, you know, people, people, um, a lot of questions online when people saw that you were coming on the show, they wanted yeah. to know what you thought about Bob Lazar. They wanted to know what you think of, 
uh, Robert Bigelow and this, that, this, that. And um, we're slowly inching towards Skinwalker Ranch, guys. I promise. <laughs> we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, so I guess something you told me offline, which I found really interesting, is you actually learned about Skinwalker. Um, the phenomenon and possibly the wrench, correct me if I'm wrong, um, while you were still employed at Area 51 before you even got over there. Is that true yeah, that you that's... learned about it there? Can you tell us a little well, about that story? I, I never knew what Skinwalker, Skinwalker Ranch was at all, but mm -hmm. I learned about Skinwalkers at the Nevada test site. That's where I learned about Skinwalkers. Um, huh. Kind of like when you go through the academy there, and you start working in these areas, you have some downtime. So you start asking some of the older guard, you know, stories. Hey, have you seen things out here in the sky? Have you, have you seen this? Have you seen that? For the most part, people are pretty quiet <laughs> about it, you know? Uh, but there was a couple of guys who were like, no, we have seen some pretty stuff and we have documented it. I'm like, what? And one of the guys said that they documented like a deer standing up on two legs and walking around and, the term that he said was, oh, yeah, it was a skinwalker. I'm like, what? And so that kind of led me down. Well, what, why would there be skinwalkers out here? And then he was like, well, it's because there's uh, a lot of Native history out here. I'm like, where? And so sure enough, he showed me on a Sunday. We drove out there. There's an area with petroglyphs that go back 10,000 years ago. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, and so it kind of puts, uh, like, puts you back. Like, what was going on out here 10,000 years ago? I know in the 1800s, um, the Paiute and the Western Shoshone were documented in the, in the Nevada test site before uh, it was taken over. But 10,000-year-old um, petroglyphs out there, so it makes you wonder, you know, what, what was going on out there. So obviously something, because they had some weird, weird things happening. So I find it interesting that a lot of these places, like Skinwalker, test site, a lot of other places have a lot of Native American history uh, aligned with it. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's um, a big part of what I want to ask you about um, your time at the ranch uh, yeah. when we when we get there. So let, let's set it up. Um, yeah. You know, like you said, you kind of flip flop back and forth from Skinwalker back to Nellis and then Skinwalker. Yeah. Um, how did you find out about the job with Bigelow? Did he reach out to you? Did you reach out to him? Um, how did that all go down? And what did you think it, when you first learned about what you'd be doing there? Well, I, it was... Uh... I, I just called an old buddy of mine who I knew in the Air Force, and I said, hey, I heard you got some project going on for an aerospace company. And he said, well, yeah, kind of. And, and then we started talking, and then we met face-to-face. -face. We met face-to-face, -face actually, where they broke ground at the new VA uh, medical center in Las Vegas. We met, in a, we met in an old parking lot out there and <laughs> on the dirt. It was like out of a movie or whatever, like, you know, and yeah. we're talking about this. And it kind of gave me the skinny of what the job entailed. But he didn't go too much in depth because I still had to do an interview with Colm and, and other people. Er, and so that's I applied and uh, he kind of vouched for me. And then I had a meeting with Colm and Colm asked me, you know, typical security questions. And then he asked me um, if I was open to the paranormal. And at first I was like, what do I say? <laughs> because <laughs> coming, I, I want to answer truthfully because I'm into the paranormal. Right. And I, he, I think he asked me, you know, have I had any experiences? And I said, yeah, actually, I've had. And um, coming from the Nevada test site, we have acute clearance. You, you don't talk about seeing UFOs or ghosts or anything like that because they can pull your clearance. Because you're dealing with nuclear security, so they take that very seriously. You got, you have to walk a line there. That's, I can't, I don't even want to, I can't explain it to you, but it's very stressful. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But so I, I, I said, you know, I'm going to ask honestly. And I said, yeah, I, I, I'm very open to that. And I, I shared with him some of my experiences in Kansas and even a couple of my experiences that in, uh, in at Nellis Air Force Base, there's a hangar called uh, 858 Propulsion Building. And it had some ghost paranormal stuff happening there. And sure enough, we went there with some other airmen. This is back in 2004 or five, maybe. Mm -hmm. Anyways, and we had an experience there. And there was like 10 witnesses that all saw it. It was, it was crazy. But so I was very open to the interview and I told him, yeah, I'm, op I'm open. And he kind of nodded his head and I left and then my buddy came out and says, Hey, you got the job. And I'm like, okay, cool. When do I start? And that was it. So I started wow. at that first, you know, in, in Vegas and then, um, back at the ranch, uh, it was two people out there at the time. So you'd have two officers out there. 
So one guy would drive up to, to relieve the other guy, and the other guy would go back. So every week there was somebody different, basically. Okay. So in October of 2010 was when I first drove up there from Vegas to the ranch and was boots on the ground. And the buddy who hired me was kind of the guy who kind of trained me up a little bit. And okay. we, it was the, the, we didn't really have an SOP or standard operating procedure of what to do. It was kind of like, okay, our job is to protect the property. I get that, secure the site. I get it. I've also collect data, report anything unusual. I'm like, okay, what do you mean unusual? You know? And this is back in 2010. I haven't, I didn't read the uh, hunt for the skinwalker book until a couple months after I've been working there. Cause I didn't want to have any pre notion in my mind of something that I, I could possibly experience. Smart. Yeah. So I remember when I applied for the job and I found out if, that I was going to this ranch in Utah, I tried to look online for something. I couldn't find anything really about skinwalker ranch. Cause back in 2010, there was only, there was like one website and, like one or two maybe youtube videos that was it yeah and so i'm like well, what the hell <laughs> i'll never forget this my dad who's kind of fall he followed my whole career in the air force and the test site and then 51 and then you know finally at skinwalker i sent him a copy of the hunt for the skinwalker book and i remember him calling me up one day and he goes and this is the only time i had concern in his voice <laughs> he goes son what the hell did you get yourself into <laughs> you know <laughs> And I was like, well, dad, I don't know. I, I just want to go down the rabbit hole and see how far it goes down. And, and he was like, just be careful. And uh, I just remember he, the sound of his voice. He seemed like he was nervous. And I'm like, I've deployed overseas. You know, and this is the time he sounds nervous. You know? <laughs> right. But, For yeah, everything so, you've gone through. And then yeah, that's this, when he's nervous. Yeah. Yeah. So then, and, and then, then that's what kind of started my time at, at Skinwalker was in October of 2010. And uh, yeah. That's where it all started. Okay. So, um, well, let's talk about that time at the ranch then. Um, yeah. Are there, what were some of the, um, the most compelling things you came across there? Obviously, people want to hear the stories of what occurs on this ranch. What is someone like you who spent weeks on end there? Uh, yeah. I'm sure there's days where absolutely nothing happens. You're bored out of your mind doing right. your, your rounds and everything. But I know you've had some pretty crazy stuff happen there too. So yeah. yeah anything you want to share with us, Chris? Sure. You know, I've been kind of hesitant about some of my experiences um, because I don't like to say things unless I can back them up with either a second witness or photographic evidence. Mm -hmm. or some type of physical evidence so i would say personally the 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 experience that stands out the most is uh the large wolf or canine experience i had in october it was actually my second week in october um out there on the property where myself and another officer uh, we had this routine down where one guy would go out for a morning run around the property and kind of get an eyes on of the uh, environment kind of get a a judge of how the day is going to go, where we're going to go check out. And the other guy would do the report from the night before and get that sent up. And then, you know, around 11 noon, we'd pack up our gear and, and hike out and go explore and look for stuff and do EVP sessions at some of the homesteads and uh, take pictures. And that's what kind of got my photography going was at the time there were, there were some questionable pictures being taken at homestead too. That for me was, was back, back, it's called backscatter, which is flash photography in a dusty environment. And uh, I was like, that's not orbs. Those are dust particles. And I, I kind of just, I kind of debunked it with my own camera because at the time I had a more, uh, more high def camera. And then I kind of mm -hmm. carried my camera, my own personal camera as a secondary ways to document the phenomena as best I could. And um, anyways, so back to the wolf story on this particular day, uh, the other officer came back from the run and he was like, Hey, I found some weird prints, some large canine prints on top of the Mesa. And I'm like, okay, let's go check it out. And I'm from Kansas and grew up on a farm where we had horses and all, you know, all kinds of animals you can think of. We lived out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, so we go out there and we see these large, it looks like, it looks like a wolf print, big, big size wolf print. But what made it weird is that there was like a section where it looked like this animal was walking on two feet. It had like this three foot stride and it, it would go to four feet, two feet. It was, it was weird. It didn't make any sense. And at the time, we had two black labs and a, a, border, a border collie dog. We had three dogs with us. 
and the labs prints, and these are full grown labs, the labs prints and some of the pictures I, I posted before, um, it, this, these wolf prints dwarfed the lab prints. And you can mm -hmm. see the, th the, the three foot strike because I, I threw a ruler down to kind of measure it. So we kind of call our uh, supervisors, uh, call them and say, hey, we've got a possible weird animal out here or something. And his advice is, you know, be, be careful, but document the best you can. I'm like, okay, roger that. So me and my a colleague were like, we're gonna, you know, we have this stupid mindset, like we're going to go capture this animal, right. not knowing what we're really dealing with. You know, this is in 2010. So that night we go out, I think it was the next night we go out and we have all of our gear with us, you know, and we're out until like three o'clock in the morning. We're setting up little makeshift campfires everywhere, trying to draw this animal in. And we felt like the whole night something was watching us and the dogs were acting very suspicious. They were like clinging to us. And normally the dogs are out running around trying to catch rabbits and stuff. But this night they were very on edge. So we knew something was up. So anyways, it starts raining a little bit and we start, we're like, oh, we've been out all night. Let's, let's call it a night. It's like three thirty, three 3 o'clock in the morning, maybe. I can't remember exactly, but I remember it was a full moon night and we start walking back to Homestead One, but we start backtracking our original, our, our original tracks for that night to see if we missed anything. And we find behind our prints, wolf prints, this thing had been following us the whole night and the dogs never picked up on it and we never saw it. So it was just a, it was just far enough away to keep a visual on us, but not not close enough for us to to see it. So now we're like, holy shit! We need to get back to the homestead, um, because this thing's tracking us now. So yeah. we're walking on the main dirt road that you see on the TV show, and we're going around the curve. Actually, it's all happened at the triangle area. So we're going around the triangle area of the ranch. Uh, and I'm about 50, 60 feet ahead of my partner. And I'll never forget this because this replays in my brain every single night. The, the moon is full and there's clouds. And my partner says, stop, I hear something. And his, he's like, he's like, his back is facing the ditch there. And I'm ahead of him. And I turn around to say, what? And as I'm turning around, it feels like time is compressing. Like, like everything slows down. And the, the clouds go over the moon and everything got really dark. And I felt like the whole frequency and vibration of the environment just dropped. Like you're walking in water. Mm -hmm. And out of the ditch, we both hear this guttural growl come out of the ditch. And something large, is like the size of a donkey or a deer, black wolf, jumps out, lands on the dirt road, takes off west. The dogs go after the animal. We go after the dogs because we're worried about the dogs fighting these, this big animal. And we're right behind the animal. And it's like we blink and it's gone and like disappeared in the darkness. And we're like, what the hell was that? And the dogs stopped dead in the tracks and looked at us like, what the hell was that? <laughs> and so we took some pictures and then we got the hell out of there and got back to Homestead 1 and did the report. And I think in the initial report, I, I put I didn't even see the animal. Because I was so freaked out about losing my clearance, my, my Q clearance, that mm -hmm. in the initial report, I said I didn't see it. Because I was, I had planned to go back to Nevada test that eventually, just because all my friends were there and had paid better and there was better benefits and stuff. But I was like, I'm not going to say, put this on the report, because my, my brain could not process what I had just experienced. Oh, man. It, it really took me back. But here's the crazy part. Not that that wasn't crazy enough, but fast forward to 2015. I'm out there by myself now because in 2011, we went to one person on the property. Now, can you imagine securing a ranch? And at the time, we yeah, had big. almost a thousand yeah. acres. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we, leased, we leased the land around us. We leased the land on top of the mesa. So we had more acreage to cover. But imagine you're supposed to secure the property by yourself at night. It's total no go. You don't do that. But we did. Yeah. But in 2015, I'm sitting in a lawn chair at the East Gate. With the dogs at the time we have three three labs now because bella had passed away and uh it was a nice quiet night i think it was in the fall again and i was kind of on my phone a little bit looking at the, the road not paying attention because by 2015 the ranch was like a second home to me i felt normal out there everything was just you know i knew weird stuff happened but you kind of i kind of um 
compare it to being deployed overseas for the first time in a combat yeah. zone. Like, you're, you know, you're on edge, you're, everything's a big experience, everything's like tunnel vision. By year, by, you know, month nine, month 10, year one, you're ready to get the hell out of there and go home. By year right. five, you're just like, whatever, it's the ranch. I don't care. It's just whatever. So you're kind of getting numb to the environment. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's bad. You get kind of complacent, which is not good. But also you're, yeah. you're, I feel like your vibration uh, kind of tunes in with the environment, if that makes sense. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm sitting on this lawn chair and my back's turned against the, the it's called the Eastern Valley. And out of the, out of this bushes of sage, I hear that same howl growl that I heard in 2010 or yeah, 2010. I come off the chair, gun out, spinning, because I thought this thing was going to attack. And I can see the shrubs move and the dogs go after it and almost come right back, like confused. So I go out with, you know, flashlight. I don't see anything. But something was there, like letting me know, hey, I'm still here. And I was like, oh, great. Now I got to walk back to the trailer, which is like a quarter mile away. And on this dirt oh, road, man. there's tons, tons of blind spots on this dirt <laughs> road. I'm, I'm going to get flanked by something and, and I'm not making it back. So the whole, I remember walking back that night, like just gun out, like, oh, this is it. I'm, I'm going to die. I'm going to die today. I'm going to die on you know? Skinwalker Ranch. Yep. Yeah. Oh. And I was just like, give me a break, you know? Damn. So, and then the other things that's happened out there, um, uh, you know, UFO related, not too much stuff that I would say I can consider UAP or UFO. And, and but re again, remind you, I didn't spend that much time staring, like looking for that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I focus more on the ground because I, I treat I treat the ranch like a giant crime scene. I wanted to collect real hard data evidence that I can link right. with the phenomenon, maybe. But anyway, I had a spot out there on the ranch I called Meditation Rock. And I would go out there with the dogs at night sometimes, especially the last couple of years I lived out there. I would go out on the, on the rock and sleep on the rocks at night with the dogs and, and watch the stars. Because I really felt like the more time I physically invested in the property, the more things would open up. Hmm. I feel that that is key to understanding the ranch. You have to really put your sweat equity and get your boots dirty. And you have to really uh, invest your energy into that environment to understand that property and when you do that i think things open up at least it did for me and i would go out in this rock and, and watch the stars and with the dogs it was a great time because you know looking back now you know there's tv shows documentaries everything's skinwalkers like a, a it's on netflix now back yeah. then back then the ranch was in my brain was never going to be a mainstream topic it was just a place that i worked at like another site that i secured before you know, the DOE and, and the test site and, and uh, my time at, and it's another job assignment, but it was a place I actually fell in love with. You know, I love being out there. I hated being away from my family, but I really enjoyed my time out there and I, and I made my time useful. So I would do my photography to help pass the time and explore and look for things. And I kind of felt yeah. pretty connected to the place. That That's great, man. And I love this idea of, um, you know, investing in, the environment and the environment will invest into you. Like it is right. such a give and take. And um, a big part of your time there was documenting uh, certain things. A lot of the native yeah. American history, which gets overlooked a lot when it comes to Skinwalker yeah. Ranch. Let's be honest. It's kind of based around this native American uh, curse or, or folklore of the area. And um, that's all we really hear about it. And then we now move on to the UFO aspect or the, you know, the portals and the the wolves and this and that, which is like, of course, amazing and um, literally phenomenal. We don't know what it is, but there's right. this whole other aspect to all of this that gets overlooked. And I think people like you, like James Keenan, like um, Carl as well, Carl Vibe, uh, you guys are documenting very important things that are getting overlooked by the mainstream when it comes to all this. So I'd love to ask you, um, what did someone like Bigelow think about your kind of approach to the ranch? You know, I mean, he's hiring people there to investigate and try to figure out what's going on with, with all the uh, paranormal stuff. But then you've got this 
ancient history there as well. Did that ever come into it when you when you were hired or with Colm? And um, what did they think of your whole approach to to investigating the ranch? It's it's kind of interesting because there was a serious lack of communication during my time out there on the property. So I'm not sure what Bigelow really thought. I know that um, I know one of the reasons why I quit the first time was because I was documenting Native American artifacts around the whole entire property and it was being overlooked. And I actually received an email from somebody who wasn't calling, there was somebody underneath him who said, stop reporting artifacts is not important. And I was like, it's 100% important because it's history. And for the first time ever, it's physical evidence. And through this evidence, we can find what was going on. Because in all Native American, not all, but in the majority of the tribes, especially in Utah, talk about the star people in their culture. So we're not going to explore this aspect of what tribes are out here. It wasn't just the Utes. It goes back to the Fremont and then even beyond that. Because let me show you how important this is. In one area like on the TV show, the finale where it shows the pillars and the, the pentagram um, that they captured in the last episode. That area, the Eastern Valley, is where I spent 90% of my time because I felt naturally drawn there, but there was also an abundance of artifacts out there in history. And I documented it. So my thought process was this. I had a, I had a topographical, topographical map of the property, and every time I'd find an artifact, I would take a picture and GPS it. And then some artifacts I'd bring back to Homestead One to do further analysis and, and online research as best I could. Some of the artifacts I actually took down to Vernal, Utah and had professionals look at to get dates. And I would, do, I would document all this stuff because I felt like if I could connect people's experiences to maybe an abundance of artifacts, there was a solid connection there for the first time ever. It wasn't just like, oh, it's this or it's that. Or, you know, there was no direction when I first got hired to what to look for. There really wasn't. It was like anything out of the ordinary reported. I'm like, okay, be more specific. There was no like, hey, focus on this or focus on that. So when I got told to stop reporting it, I was like, what, what's the deal here? So uh, that kind of upset me a lot because I invested so much of my time doing that. And I thought that was extremely important. And I still do to this day. So much so that I've gone back to the basin on my own and documented other locations around the entire basin that have the same type of connective phenomena, which is, you know, reporting skinwalkers and UFOs, but there's also a Native American, Native, Native American base there, you know. But in the area um, in the Eastern Valley, the artifacts are this important. In one location, I found artifacts that go back 1,500 years ago, the archaic, archaic period. In the same location, I found paleo artifacts that go back 10,000 years ago. So you have overlapping layers of history in one location. You know, what was going on out there during that time? Much like the Nevada test site where they saw skinwalkers and there's petroglyphs that go back 10,000 years ago. And Skinwalker Ranch, same thing. McConkie Ranch, same thing. Blind Frog Ranch has stuff out there. Uh, McKee Springs, uh, Nine Mile Canyon. And you, there's, it's undeniable. You cannot ignore that anymore. There's, there's history there and it's worth exploring. And I'm not the only guy doing it. There's, there's been people before me who, who brought up the same type of stuff that I'm talking about now. I just so happen mm -hmm. to photograph and document it. And, you know, I've linked up with James Keenan and Carl Vibe, and they've helped me as well. You know, James Keenan's got an insane amount of knowledge about this stuff, about, especially about petroglyphs. And Carl's got a, a great eye, and he's also very into it. He's, he's very knowledgeable about this stuff. So, um, you know, linking up with the right guys, you know, the term, the term iron sharpens iron. You want to surround yourself with some of the best guys. I'm surrounded with some of the best guys, I believe, that are not just looking for a payout. They're looking for truth. And that's important when it comes down to it because I think there's something worth exploring more. And that's what I'm continuing to do on my own is that. I love but, yeah, that. I know Colin was more open to it. I think we had a conversation where he was like, just keep doing it, but don't do it on, on the Daily Journal. So I, that's when I took it upon myself to keep my own personal journal and documenting everything myself. And that's what I did for five, six, the whole time I was out there. I have my own personal journal of, of documentation of stuff, or, or not just artifacts, but also areas of interest that are highly important into understanding what's going on out there. And when 
like the whole UAP stuff that's out now, it seems like that's such a mainstream topic. It almost seems like that's that's the new narrative now that has to be crammed down everybody's throat. Is everything's UAP? Everything's UAP. UFO. UFOs are threats. UAPs are threats. I just I don't buy it. I don't I don't buy it, man. I don't buy it because of where I used to work at, but also I'm having an open mind here. If we're talking about real aliens, is that what we're talking about? Okay, so we're talking about a culture of of beings that are so advanced, they're going to come here and do what? Wipe us out? Are we going to be able to stop that? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think that we're going to be able to. But why would they wipe us out? They're probably coming here using us as a resource, much like we use cattle as a resource. So they probably mm -hmm. view us as nothing but cattle, and they use us as a resource. So then they're not going to hurt their resource. They may stop us from hurting ourselves because I've said before, the only threat to humanity is humanity itself. We are such a destructive species. We're bound for extinction. And we don't care. We're just like, whatever. It doesn't matter because we have so many distractions now. And that's why the Native American stuff is so important. These people didn't have distractions. So if they're taking the time to make petroglyphs about portals or whatever, giants or whatever else in their area, they're doing that for a reason. They're not just bored. Okay? We're, not, we're talking 8,000, 10,000 years ago. People are foraging and hunting every day to live. That they're not going like, to get bored yeah. and say, hey, I'm going to go scribble on these rocks because I'm bored. No, they're trying to relay information. And so it's just ignored because we're taught in our culture, in American culture, to, to like not focus on that. When in reality, full circle, we need to be focusing back in the Native tribes and their cultures and their teachings because they had it right. You know, we want all these scientific explanations and data and evidence. And I get that. I'm totally for that. But maybe it's more important if we just sit back on a mesa or on a rock or by a river and just absorb the moment and learn. That's the key, is absorbing the time. And who cares about documenting the evidence? I get to a point, but it's more important to focus on the moment. Because I've said before, the ranch is bigger than a TV show. It's bigger than my photography. It's bigger than a contract with the government. It is real Native American, indigenous culture, history. And... It needs to be respected and learned. And the only way to learn is just sitting there and absorbing it. You have to be there to absorb it. You have to go out to these places, these petroglyphs, and see them for yourself and think to yourself, what was going on out here? You know, because yeah. in today's society, we're so distracted with iPads and TV shows. They didn't have anything like that. The stars were their iPad. The, the earth was their, their, their Netflix. <laughs> and that's what they watched. And they learned yeah. from that. I mean, let's be real here. It's just like, it, it, it feels like I've been taking crazy pills since 2011 because in 2011 is when I found my first artifact in the Eastern Valley and that flipped my whole perception of everything. I was like, whoa, there's something else going on out here. And then I felt like the, this may sound crazy, but it's the honest to God truth. The whole time I was out there, I felt like I was being guided by something bigger. Something was guiding me to find this stuff because it wasn't just one artifact. No. It was other areas of interest. Some of those areas, which I showed on the TV show, a cave that was on the show. That's one of many areas I know out there personally that are very important to the overall aspect and view of the ranch. And I think it's great that Utah's getting that, uh, you know, attention because it's drawing more people out to the basin so they can experience themselves and make their own assumptions. Because it's very easy for us to be very judgmental at home and, and, you know, arm care, or armchair quarterback stuff, and, and you never go out there and experience it. And you don't have to even go to Utah. There's places probably in your local areas with Native history that you can go out and just learn about it. You might learn something. And really, yeah. for me, the ranch was about spiritual evolution. That's how it boiled down to me. It was just about evolving as a human being. And that's what I kind of did. With my, and I kind of showed that through my photography. Like the ranch, it's viewed as a real scary, like you always hear the spookiest place in the world, the most paranormal hotspot. And it is. It, the ranch can be as dark as you want or as light as you want. It's based on the individual, what you're going to mm -hmm. focus your attention on. And I focused on the dark a little bit, and then I focused on the light. But I, my, my primary focus was the light. And the capture and the beauty of the ranch of the property, that was my focus. And I kind of felt like, that opened up the ranch more because I was so focused on subject matters of like, you know, artifacts, rock formations, the vegetation, animals. And so I kind of 
that kind of helped me understand the ranch more. I used to do this thing um, to put my mind in the in the kind of in the focus, like laser focus. I would uh, I would imagine that I had just landed on a different planet, and I was and I was an alien or an alien explorer, and it was my job to find proof of life. So I would land in in Utah, and it was my job to go out and find artifacts, to find evidence, to later go back to report. And I kind of that kind of helped me focus on the minor details of being out there. And I still kind of use that technique today. I go out and I say, okay, I'm an alien. I just landed. And it's my job to find proof of life. <laughs> it sounds yeah. crazy, but it's, and it's just, I don't know. Maybe I was at the ranch for too long. Had too much time <laughs> on my hands. But <laughs> No, I'm just see, being I, exactly, man. And that's what we want. We want you to be real with us because, you know, we get this kind of filtered perception of the ranch through the books, through the TV shows. And, you know, I respect the work being done there. There's no denying, okay. like, I think people like Brandon Fugel and even Bigelow to an extent, like, they right. wanted answers. They have a burning curiosity. They've had experiences. They want to know. And they have the resources to do that. That's amazing. But, um, but the I, people I, that are I, asking... Yeah, please. The, the people that are asking those questions, like Bigelow, Fugel, not so much. Fugel goes out there, but people that ask those questions, they need to go physically to those locations and put that time in. Right. They can't just do it third party. And expect to get the truth. Because right. what if those people who are giving you that information are not honorable people? They're dishonest and they're feeding you a bunch of crap. Mm -hmm. You have to be, I know if I'm passionate about something, I'm going to go directly to the source and figure it out. Or right. try to or try to figure it out. And that's what kind of Carl did recently. You know, Carl had this whole Magic Mesa thing. And he could have doubled down and said it's all paranormal or UFOs. But he didn't. He went out there and debunked his own thing. And that's saying something. Absolutely. And I think when it comes to some of these locations, there's been people who have lied. I know there has been personally who have lied to impress people or to get the favors of somebody or whatever the reason why. Is. And it's not uncommon to think that it happens every single day in society where employees do their best to, you know, impress their boss. It happens everywhere and every single job in America and across the world. So how is it going to be different at these locations? You want to impress your boss. You want to produce. But yeah. what are you going to produce? Bullshit or truth? I focus on the truth, man. That's it. I love it. Well, okay. Truth is the perfect way to kind of tackle um, what I think is going to be the most controversial part of this conversation, Chris. And I have to ask because I know yeah. – a lot of people, um, they're frustrated with the lack of transparency that came from the Bigelow era of the ranch. You know, right. a lot of people, they're, they're not excuse, their explanation for why they're frustrated is because taxpayer money did end up going to studying Skinwalker Ranch through right. a Pentagon funded program. So I have to ask you, as someone who worked on the ranch, were you ever aware that the U.S. government actually was funding some of the research going on at the ranch and uh what do you make of the whole government ties to skinwalker ranch what well, that's a good question because i didn't really i knew i've like nobody sat me down and said okay here's the game plan here's what's going on and that's like a communication and that's why those programs fail like a communication hmm. and there's some people that say OSAP was a uh a success and there's some some areas it was a success but also it was a complete failure because from the start, there was a lack of communication. There was no set objective at all during my time. So it really kind of boils down to the start. If you're going to talk about OSAP, and this all started from Jane Lukowski, who was a DIA agent who reached out to Robert Bigelow back in 2007, right? Mm -hmm. And says, hey, I want to come check out your ranch. And Bigelow is like, okay. So right there, that's kind of a, to me, it seems like a red flag because anytime the government gets involved with the private sector, who's that really the benefit? The private right. sector or the government? So anyway, so Lukowski goes on the property and in less than two hours has an experience, you know, so incredible that he goes back to the Pentagon and gets funding for OSAP with zero evidence. That's another red flag. Why? How, how are you going to get money with zero evidence just based on yeah. somebody's experience? Nobody's questioning that. Are you serious? It's like, and then, so that's not the part that, that strikes me as odd. Cause I never knew about the casket at all the whole time I worked there. But if you have a guy who had an experience and he's just sitting in Washington 
not out there on the ranch. And he obviously had his tap on the universe's door where he was able to get funding for this experiment. But he's not out there, boots on the ground with me and other guys out there. What's the point? It's, it's set up for failure from the start because your, your, your most important asset resource who had the connection is gone. He's nowhere to be found. So now it's left to a bunch of prior military veterans to go out there and, and do what? Figure what out? It seems like the whole program was a fail to the, in the beginning because of the lack of communication. We still were able to collect data and, and, and have some experiences, but it makes you wonder, you know, what, was it, what else was going on out there that we didn't know about? It seemed, like the, the, it seemed like certain people during my timeline avoided the ranch like the plague. And it's just like, what do you want us to do out here? There's... There's limited direction. So and that's like the military mindset is like work more with less. And so that's what we do. You work more with less. You still have a job to do. But to me, you know, after learning about OSAP, because I didn't know about OSAP until 2019, but I learned about Lukatsky and stuff. Uh, I didn't know that he even came out there and had an experience. And it wasn't until later with the new book and stuff that, he, that I found out. But I thought to myself, what a wasted opportunity because – it would have been great for him to come out there because he's had, he has a connection out there, and that's how the ranch works. I, I feel like the ranch has a connected connectedness to people or whatever. So why wouldn't you want to come back out? It doesn't make any sense to me, you know. It feels like a missed opportunity, you know. And I don't know. If, if, if the reason why he didn't come out was because he had a bad experience, and I guess according to the book, there was five other guys who came out there, and Neil Hawk they all had horrible experiences and their families were affected. So if that new book that came out was created to set the record straight and everything in that book is factual or real, and you're saying that these people had all these horrible experiences, why the hell are we out there on the ranch by ourselves indefinitely running and gunning? That's okay. That's not okay. You can't keep, you can't put people out there and not tell them what's going on? I mean, am I wrong here? It seems like, imagine well, putting yourself in my situation. Right. Put yourself in my situation for a second. And your job is to secure the property, collect data, and you're doing it as best as you can. And you do it for years and years and years. And then to come to find out there was another program going on, OSAP, and there was people that had horrible experiences that affected their families. And I had things happen to my family horrible things that directly from the ranch. And I knew other colleagues of mine had bad things. So my family is expendable. My health is expendable. It's unacceptable. And there, that it's, it's a point that everybody just kind of glazes over. And it's a point that needs to be at some point, there needs to be some accountability or at least somebody needs to call me up and have a conversation because that's the right okay. thing to do. Cause I feel like we are just abandoned out there with no, no real direction. I'm so happy you brought this up because the one of the most, I would say, touchy subjects when it comes to all of this is this idea. I, I'm just going to come out and say it. Some people think that people like you or even the current people on the ranch are being, I, I hate using this word, but we're being used as like guinea pigs is the term people have said. You have people like um, Travis Taylor who got radiation poisoning. You had members right. of, um, you know, during your time, other people who had ailments or brought home these hitchhiker effects as they've sort, sort of coined it. But, um, you know, that's the paranormal side. Then we have the actual clinical physiological uh, ailments that have occurred on this ranch. So I, I guess I'll just flat out ask you, what are your opinions on those who do claim that you guys were being used as some sort of experiment? Yeah, it's... Man, I'll tell you, <clears throat> it puts me in a dark place. It really does. Because I don't want to think that, but it's hard. it's hard not to think that when you look back at the timeline and there was lack of communication, like I said, you know, lack of equipment, that's, that's no problem. You know, we, that's just how it was. Uh, not having one working camera out there, that's suspect. <laughs> Your job for security is supposed to have some type of thing, but there's all these questions, me and my guys who worked out there, we all kind of joked around about that. Oh, we're just lab rats out here. We joked around about that, but we never thought it was real. 
But I will say in 2019, I met a, a scientist in the Uinta Basin, and the first three things he said to me, and this is in early 2019, he said to me, um, we had a private conversation. Actually, it wasn't private. There was, mother, there was other witnesses there. But the first thing he said to me was, did I know about radiation out here on the property in Utah, in the basin? And I'm like, what? No. And then he said, did you know about $22 million? And I was like, no. And then the last thing he said to me, and when he said this, my heart sunk into my stomach. He said, you know, how does it feel to know you're possibly a guinea pig in all this? And I remember saying, if that's true, I don't feel very good about it. And then at, at that time, my whole mind flipped upside down. I'm like, what the? F it, then like all these memories started coming back. And um, I don't know. It's I'm still left, you know, for I'll be honest with you, Ryan, this whole thing about me even coming out publicly in 2019 was probably never supposed to happen. Um, but I have questions that need answering. And I feel like every single time I open up a door to or every time I close a door two more open up mm -hmm. and it just blows my mind. It really does, because I've served honorably for this country. I've done I've, I've, I've sacrificed everything. And especially for the ranch, I had I sacrificed, but my family has sacrificed. And I will tell you, if that's true, I don't I don't know what to say. Really, it really uh, I, I don't have a lot of words to say about it. Mm -hmm. I, fair, I'm man. still trying to I'm just trying to figure it out, you know, as best I can. And I don't know, <clears throat> I, you know, meeting people like uh, James uh, Keenan and Carl and and some of the people in the community online have really helped me out a lot. And if it wasn't for them, I'd probably be in a pretty dark place. And then I met Taras Matla, obviously with the university of Maryland. And, the, and that was a huge bonus because I was able to document or I was able to donate my entire skinwalker archive to the university of Maryland. And for me, that was a big closure moment for me because I was able to kind of lock away that those memories and, 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 and some of that stuff in in a, in a place that will always be there forever. And my kids can go back and view that, the photography. And it's just awesome. You know, to Ross Matler with the University of Maryland, um, he really helped me out. And it's because it's because Taras saw something online. He saw I had an artistic eye. And he also was like, whoa, this is Skinwalker Ranch. Nobody has ever posted pictures like this before on Skinwalker Ranch. And I did it. I post those pictures online because I want to show people that it wasn't all scary. It was all beautiful. It was there was some dark times out there, but it's also some gorgeous times out there. But for me, when I look back at my photography, I look back at my photography now, and it puts me in that mind frame of being alone out there and using my photography to kind of get through the weeks and get through some of the sketchy times. Because I'll tell you, walking from Homestead 1 all the way down to the West Gate at night at 2 o'clock in the morning, and you're by yourself, and you got a couple dogs with you. <laughs> There's some nights where you, you get to Homestead 2, and you feel like, you know what? Something's telling me not to keep going forward. I need to go, and I would. I would listen to my gut extent all the time because I felt like you're always being washed out there. Yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, it, it, I don't have any ill feelings to my previous employer. That shocks a lot of people. People think that, oh, my God, you should definitely have ill. Why? How's that going to help? Because if you really talk about disclosure and discovering the truth, I hate to say it, but it comes with sacrifices. It does. So in this situation, I played my position of what I was supposed to do. Other people played their position, and that's how these special access programs work. However, in most special access programs, there is a constant open form of communication where everybody is on the same playing field, and there's information spreading very openly. Mm -hmm. Because in this situation with Skinwalker, because there was a lack of communication, most of the guys, including myself, didn't report half the stuff that we experienced because it seemed like nobody cared. That's the truth. It seemed like nobody cared because we would, I, why, why am I spending my, there was a time where I would be inside Homestead 2, sitting in a lawn chair at 2 o'clock in the morning by myself, trying to make contact with whatever out there. And I remember one night thinking to myself, what the hell am I doing? I, I'm outgunned out here. And I'm like, you know, all these things were playing in the back of your mind, like, what if a trespasser gets on the property and I'm not at the East Gate to stop them and they get on here and they 
vandalized? Are these still something? At the time, we had the ranch managers on there. What if somebody gets hurt? And then here's the best part. So I'm in the homesteads, and this is all playing in the back of my mind. I'm constantly operating the red zone. And then it's not like I clock out and I go home or I go down to a hotel to, to go to sleep. No, I go to sleep at Homestead 1 <laughs> at Skinwalker Ranch. And I remember every night closing my eyes, thinking to myself, I hope nobody gets on the property and puts a bullet in my head. Wow. Because during my time, during my time, we had legitimate threats from locals that wanted to shoot one of us to prove that we were, that we were either cursed or a hybrid. Right. So all this is going in the back of your mind. So psychologically, you're just pegged out, man. You're just like operating, you know, and then all this stuff comes, all this stuff comes out. TV shows come out, documentaries come out. And I'm just sitting there like, are you kidding me? Are you seriously kidding me? And I'll tell you what, man, there's been about 15 times where I've just uh, about almost just packed everything up, deleted all my accounts and just let the narrative play out and say, I guess it'll be like another MK Ultra deal. Like when I'm 70 years old, I'll find out what was going right. on at Skinwalker Ranch. You know, right. I don't know. I have a lot of unanswered questions, and I'm I, I'm I'm pat. My patience is, is gone now. It really is. And I'm just trying to close the door for my kids. That's it. I have three young men I'm trying to raise, <clears throat> and to know that my time on Skinwalker Ranch may have affected my health negative, where time is now taken away from me because of my long-term exposure out there, I will tell you that does not sit very well with me. It, I don't think it would for any father. No, you know? absolutely. Man. I, everything you have said, um, I'm sure is resonating with a hell of a lot of, first of all, veterans out there. And second yeah. of all, just human beings is yeah. what you've done in sacrifice mm -hmm. for your country, for, um, for the scientific community, supposedly that's what they right. wanted were scientific answers and beyond. So, um, you know, before I move on here, uh, thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for what you did on the ranch. Thank you for, um, for opening yourself up to that and making those sacrifices yeah. because I think we are getting closer to answers and I'm happy you didn't pack up and just leave. Cause I do honestly yeah. feel that your contribution to this skinwalker mystery, uh, is essential showing the light. I think again, all we get is the spooky shit and the, the right. you know, the really um, sensational stuff. And then you have, like you said, with the uh, the photo exhibition at, at the university uh, that shows how unbelievably beautiful this ranch and this basin and this state are. So, yeah. yeah. First of all, thank you for all of that. Oh, I appreciate that. I run out of do. Um, and I'm not saying that my, um, you know, my my layer of Skinwalker Ranch is the right answer with, with the Native American stuff. I'm just saying to me personally, it's probably the most important layer because I feel like it's overlooked. But all the stuff that the new team's doing with all the scientific stuff that they've collected, it's unbelievable. I mean, I've been on the, I've been back on Skinwalker Ranch now several times with or without the film crew. I've gone out there on my own with and, and met with the team and, and helped them with other investigations and they've shown me data. And it blows me away the stuff that you've collected. You know, you got Eric Bard out there with Brandon Fugel's team. That guy gets it, and he's invested his energy out there. And he's out there, and he's not messing around. He doesn't care about no TV show. I'll tell you that right now. He does not care one single damn about a TV show. He's out there really trying to figure out on a scientific level what's going on out there. And I think that's extremely important. And then you have Thomas Winterton and Caleb Bench out there that are locals, and they're out there all the time too. Um, those guys, they truly get it, you know, and they, they put in that equity to understand. And they, you know, there's so many overlapping layers with Skinwalker Ranch. Mm -hmm. It's just, if there's magnetic anomalies around there, and maybe that's what draw, maybe that's what drew the natives out there to begin with, was those anomalies, you know. Right. Um, maybe that's what drew them out there to begin with. And there's all kinds of stuff. I mean, I, I'm just one piece of the puzzle. I'm not saying I'm the skinwalker expert by any means but i just feel like uh, i have some very important data and i like to and i appreciate your time for me to allow me to share some of that data with other people that might have these questions as well do you like stories of the strange the weird and the unexplained then we want you to check out jim harold's campfire the concept is pretty simple jim talks to regular people about strange stuff that happens to them 
And yes, that includes UFOs, along with cryptids, ghosts, and head scratchers. He doesn't exaggerate or play a lot of spooky music, kinda like I'm doing right now. The stories speak for themselves. One's like a ghost story involving serial killer Ted Bundy, or the young man who encountered an eight-legged demon. Then there's the story of an alien abduction by what could be considered a reptilian. Now not all the stories are horrifying. Some are actually pretty heartwarming, like a visit from a past loved one or a peaceful near-death experience. Regardless, these are true and fascinating stories told by ordinary people who've had extraordinary experiences. Tune in to Jim Harold's Campfire on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to Somewhere in the Skies. And remember, stay spooky. Hey guys, Ryan here. The Somewhere in the Skies podcast is a labor of love every week. And with that comes many different costs to keep the show running. That's where our Patreon campaign comes in. You give what you think the show is worth. There's different rewards available all the time, including shoutouts on the show, early editions of main episodes, bonus episodes and content, and very soon, monthly patron hangouts, where we sit back and chat all things UFOs. So I hope you'll consider becoming a Patreon subscriber today. To learn more and to join, visit patreon.com slash somewhere skies. Thank you for your support and keep looking up. Well, Chris, I've got some listener questions for you, man. If you're willing to sure. stick around, some people really wanted to uh, ask you some burning questions here. Is that cool? Absolutely. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to start with Melanie. Melanie is one of our Patreon subscribers, mm -hmm. and our patron members actually get priority to ask our guests questions. Um, so she's got a really good one here. She says, the burning question for me is, what does Chris think is really happening at the ranch current research being done seems to lean towards portals what does he think about that yeah this whole portal aspect you know um not only are we hearing that like maybe this is where the uap are coming in and out of but also right. that the tribes have used these portals as well they're part of right. the petroglyphs so what do you make of that whole aspect of this the portals right i i think that the portals is a good possibility because not only did um the, the current team out there now has documented some pretty weird anomalies in the skies and stuff, but also NIDS uh, said they saw portal stuff activity out there as well. And uh, being out there myself, I never saw anything like that, but going back to some of my old pictures, you know, I've got like 3000 images of the ranch during that time. I've tried to kind of go back and, and uh, see if I missed something. That was one of the reasons why I donated those uh, pictures of the archive to the university of Maryland. So more eyes can see that, that uh, those pictures. But um, I think everything is Native American based, in my personal opinion. Um, the evidence is, you know, follow the data. Well, the data is all around the whole Uinta Basin. It's not just Skinwalker Ranch. It's the whole Uinta Basin. And uh, there's there's petroglyphs uh, in McKee Springs that show portal activity or portals and things coming out of portals. Um, so when you see that, you wonder, you know, what the hell is going on? Um uh, Skinwalker Ranch, it might be another location where people were drawn to to see these things or have experiences. You know, the Fremont Indians that were there, they were there for a thousand years and like fell off the map. But people, locals say that the Fremonts almost appeared out of nowhere. So, and also mm -hmm. giants. There was talk about giants coming through portals and stuff. And that's more James Keenan's expertise. I would highly recommend you have him on the show. He knows a lot more about that stuff. Uh, my, mm -hmm. my primary focus is obviously the Native American artifacts and the history and the photography and, and that type of stuff. What uh, what were some of those artifacts that you came across? Um, would you mind sharing maybe a couple of those with us? I'm, yeah, I'm I found person, yeah. the first artifact that I found was in the Eastern Valley. It was actually a knife blade. And uh, how I found it was bizarre. I had this routine that I would go with the dogs and we'd walk around the whole entire property and we'd end up and have lunch in the Eastern Valley on this rock table out there. And I would feed the dogs um, food and water, and I would kind of sit there and just absorb the area. And I laid my backpack down, and uh, I went to pick up my backpack, 
and I must have missed it, but laying next to my backpack was a silver um, granite arrowhead. I'm like, what the hell? And I picked it up, and I'm like, whoa. And my whole mind kind of shifted, and then I kind of do a grid pattern around the property, and I'd find, you know, axe heads, um, grindstones. Um, you agate is very important to the, to the locals that are out there and the indigenous tribes before that because you agate is what was used to make tools and weapons and stuff like that. So when you find you agate deposits, you're going to find flaking and, and stuff like that. And Bottle Hollow has a lot of you agate around it as well. And so I found another area. Um, it's actually a hollowed rock. And um, I found a bunch of sweatstones around this rock. So that area was used for ceremony, ceremonial purposes. And that's pretty significant because the area kind of showed signs of maybe one or two people living there. Like mm. it was nomadic. So maybe a skinwalker. I don't know. Mm. Um, and then I found stuff in, uh, in, in Blind Frog Ranch. I found stuff pretty much anywhere in the Uinta Basin. If I trek out, my eyes are always on the ground looking because my grandfather back here in Kansas when I was a kid, when I was a young kid, um, he would take me out to these local fields and rivers and streams and he would get permission from all the landowners because he used to work for the rock quarry. So he knew all the local farmers. And so he would get permission to go look for rocks on their property. And I would go out with them every Sunday and he would show me what to look for and the do's and don't and the do's and don'ts. You know, if there was a burial site, you don't mess with it. Um, and other things, what to look for, areas of interest. And my grandfather really is the one who trained me to look for that stuff. I didn't really put it together until I got to the ranch. And uh, yeah, I found all kinds of yeah. stuff. It all happened for a reason. I love yeah. that. Um, Amy, Amy on Patreon also asks, uh, you know, a lot of the experiments this, this season on the show, um, we had evidence of possible like uh, cloaking almost like invisibility, you know, in the, one of the last episodes of the TV show, um, you know, they set these rockets up to try to gather data. And it's almost as if like these rockets bounced off and went in another direction in the, triangle this area that you're very familiar with right and um i i guess amy wants to know uh any evidence when you were there or anything you heard about with like cloaking technology or possible invisibility stuff whether no. in the sky or on the ground no no but i mean you always get that sensation like you're being watched you know right it right. always felt like you're being watched and sometimes it wasn't just while you're out walking around there was a lot of times I'd be at home. Or I'd be at I'd be at homestead one, skyping with my wife, and um, I would feel like somebody was watching me inside the homestead. And it, it, used, to, it used to freak me out, but then after a while, you get kind of used to it. There was one time I'll never forget this, and I never I never mentioned this before, but there was one time I was it was in the daytime, and I was walking from homestead two down to homestead three, and uh, right in between there, I felt like something was in the southern tree line like staring at me stalking at me to the point where i actually turned around and faced it and was like something's in that tree line and i sat there for like five ten minutes with like this hand like this <laughs> my map maybe it was my imagination or something i don't know but it was weird but i felt like something was always there i know my, some of my previous colleagues who worked there uh none of them ever reported that stuff either so but okay. then again we didn't have cameras and stuff out there. It was just us. So it's Which hard still, to document stuff. I that know. baffles my mind, man. That, oh, God, don't get me started. And the fact that, like, you know. had a better camera personally, yeah. then we won't go there. That's that's another yeah. conversation. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, moving back to, uh, I guess, Area 51 for a moment. Um, mm -hmm. I don't ideology on Twitter asks... Chris, did you ever come into contact with or become aware of anything that is definitely man-made but would be perceived by general populace as extraterrestrial? Um, anything you could share, I understand if not, but yeah. Yeah, anything like that, man, where it's like, dude, definitely ours, but you, yeah, yeah. Because we always hear that idea of like anything going on out there with black projects is like, 40 we hear about it the public hears about it, it's 30 40 years later um, yeah i mean yeah look at the yeah, f-117 project you know the f-117 project it was years later than the public knew about it so it makes you wonder you know what do we have in our inventory you know yeah um uh yeah can i confirm or deny okay i mean honestly That's i don't fair. i don't know i don't know there i don't know 
Okay. I, I saw, I've seen some pretty interesting stuff, and I guess I can just leave it at that. I'm just glad we live in the United States and we have technology that will keep us safe, hopefully. So that's about all, right. all I can say. I'd, hey, that gives me a little comfort knowing that. Yeah. <laughs> um, EMP Wrecker on Twitter asks, was there ever any experiment that went wrong at Skinwalker Ranch where like, you know, it was like, okay, we got to we gotta not mess with this or like abort um, mission on this. Anything like that? Uh, besides myself being the experiment? <laughs> Kidding, joking. Um, no. <laughs> Semi-joking, um, yeah. Yeah, right. No, we had, we did a remote viewing experiment once and I knew it kind of got some negative feedback from another officer. Um, hmm. I never knew, I never knew the end result from that experiment. I wish I did. Um, other experiments, I guess if you call them experiment, was sitting inside Homestead too, uh, trying to make contact with the paranormal or whatever. Um, that was pretty dicey. I know one guy literally drove himself insane doing that. So that, that was a big red flag. That's about all I can remember. Okay. You know? Okay. But um, there wasn't, I mean, we, we did experiments, but it wasn't that many. You know, I, I came in in 2010, kind of the very end of, of the project. You know, there was only a small handful of us out there operating. So I know maybe guys before me maybe did more stuff. I don't know. I know I've reached out to some of the guys who were before they were out there before me and it was pretty much kind of the same thing. So I don't, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, that's totally fair. Um, Robert on Facebook asks, are you familiar with any teleportation technology such as jump rooms, portals, stargates? We kind of touched on that with the portal thing, but um, yeah. yeah, in your, you know, your experience working at these top secret locations and stuff, was that ever, conversation or are we still nowhere near that sort of technology i, I have i honestly don't know i mean yeah i have, I have no idea I, I there's some very smart people that work at the test site in 51 that are very very smart very intelligent so who, who knows i don't know yeah. I, don't, I, can't, I can't confirm because i i'm only like to say stuff that i can prove you know or, or, or second second witness or something but i've never seen anything personal like that no yeah okay yeah, that's totally fair. Uh, the One Revolution on Twitter asks, um, does S4 exist? This supposed location in a hangar out there at Groom Lake that Bob Lazar has talked about. Um, and I guess to kind of play off of that, this whole idea of, you know, Area 51 in general. It's such a part of mythology now. You right. can go to the gates, get a selfie. You had this storm area 51 thing. So the it, it to me, that just screams anything really sensitive that was going on there was probably moved somewhere else. I could be completely off on that. But um, yeah, what do you make of the claims of this S4 location? Does that resonate at all with you? And also... Uh, underground facilities. I mean, I'm sure we have tons of those in the United States. Um, what is your best guess of what Area 52 might be, I guess? So, yeah, two-pronged question there, I guess. Yeah, I, I've never seen, personally, uh, S4. I, it wouldn't surprise me if it exists. It would not su surprise me one bit because okay. the, the site is so big. There's so much areas to cover. Um and there's some areas, believe it or not, we're not even allowed to access, even if you work security and, and, and police out there. There's some areas that are so so uh, secret that you can't even go on yourself with a Q clearance. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's I mean, there's so much stuff online you can look at for the Nevada test site. There's the UNA uh, hangar that's, you know, not a, a thousand feet underground, laboratory. There's all kinds of stuff. You know, I, actually, I have a whole bunch of... Uh, Working there, I took a bunch of pam their free pamphlets about the history of the Nevada test site. Really cool stuff. I mean, I think you can go online and find a lot of stuff. And it probably surprised a lot of people. Mm. Some of the stuff that's available online about um, Nevada test site and Air 51, too. But that, it probably does exist, S4. I'm assuming it probably does. There's a lot of, a lot of weird stuff out there, so who knows. But gotcha. I've never personally been there myself. But the next Area 52... Hmm. Wyoming. I'll say Wyoming. Yeah. 
Okay. You just That's leave it at that? Or you... Okay. That. Okay. <laughs> yep. There you go, guys. Everyone start going to Wyoming and uh, start from there. <laughs> That's just my guess. I mean, there's other places too. I mean, I don't know. I mean. Yeah, of course. Who knows? That's totally fair. Um, awesome, man. Well, hey, I want to give you um, these final moments here to uh, one, one of the best quotes that I pulled from something you said on the Skinwalker Ranch television show and Brandon Fugel even tweeted this out, a quote from you because it was, it encompasses everything. And you mentioned right. it earlier in this conversation of this is bigger than a scientific experiment, bigger than a government contract. It's bigger than all of us. So yeah. I'd love to know what does that truly mean to you? And what are some of the final words you want to leave our audience with, with all of this? whether it's the UFO topic, Skinwalker Ranch. Um, yeah, what do you want to leave people with uh, before we, we wrap things up here? Yeah, um, yeah, I do believe the ranch, the whole Uinta Basin is bigger than what people realize. You know, there's real, there's real history out there. You know, we call it the paranormal, the phenomenon, when in, in reality it's considered culture in indigenous tribes. It's part of the culture. Like I said, we're behind we're behind the curve here of understanding um, all that stuff. So I really believe the, the the Native American history is the most important aspect, in my opinion. And that's just because how much I've invested looking for that type of stuff. <clears throat> and I think that's what I mean when I say it's bigger than all of us, because there is stuff that's out there that's just a, a really blows your mind like what is going on well what happened out here there's so many overlapping layers of not yeah. not just the native american aspect but there's like the meteorite strikes the gilsonite the magnetic anomalies uh it seems like that whole section in utah is just like a paranormal hot spot of all kinds of stuff but a lot of it all relates back to native american and there's been people who said well how come other uh, Indian reservations aren't haunted or report this stuff, and the truth is they do. Yeah, there's several. There's several. There's several reservations that report this stuff. I mean, my mom was born and raised on, or she was raised. My mom was actually born in uh, Roswell Air Force Base. My grandfather was working at, Air, at Roswell Air Force Base back in the day. But my Whoa. my mom actually was nice grew up uh, right there. <laughs> yeah, I, I I was thinking about that today. My grandfather worked at Roswell. He was in the Air Force, and my mom was born born on Roswell Air Force Base. But my mom uh, was also raised around uh, a lot of uh, reservations because my great grandfather used to be the subcontractor for for building schools and churches and stuff. So oh, she was raised. She was raised in the Four Corners, and all those tribes. Talk about UFOs, star people, skinwalkers, werewolves, whatever you want to call it. And I don't know why that's just ignored. You know, it seems like, I don't know, it's, it's not, it's just the more pieces to the puzzle, I guess, you know. But for me, that's what I think is the most important, you know. Yeah. One of the most important aspects. I hope people take more time into like really diving back into those cultures and understanding the people who are here before us, you know, and, uh, I think that's important. Absolutely. I love that. And you've highlighted that so well with the uh, photography project that you did. So in the final moments here, Chris, um, can you tell us where we can find your portfolio of all the incredible photos you have? Because I'm going to share some of those in the post edit here um, yeah. with the audience, if that's okay with you. And um, tell us a little about, I know you have a film project that might be coming up. If there's anything you can share, um, I'd yeah. love to give you that opportunity. Um, yeah, let us know where we can find all your work, if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, Taras Matlow, you know, he's the director for the University of Maryland. You know, he reached out to me a couple years ago, and we had a start. We started a conversation, and um, uh, he had a, uh, you know, he at first he asked, you know, to buy some prints. And I said no, I'll just donate all of them to the university because I wanted to get more eyes on to the situation. You know, with my photography um but that archive is online at um uh skinwalker ranch uh portfolio.org is where you can find that and there's going to be a mini documentary attached to that a short one and it's going to have uh my own story in it basically and highlighting some of my most favorite pictures in it and some of the flip photography that i do as well where i take images and i flip them and create like ufos out of mesa rocks and um stuff like that and um 
so yeah, and I have a website too, chrisbartel.com. I don't update as much as I used to, but I probably should do a new rehaul and put some more pictures on there and stuff. But you can find some of my other projects I've worked on and some of my old uh, Las Vegas portfolio because I have a huge Las Vegas portfolio of like 20,000 images. I mean, I have you know, 20 plus years in Las Vegas. I kind of treated uh, like Ansel Adams is my one of my favorite photographers. So I wanted to create this approach to Las Vegas, like if Ansel Adams came to Las Vegas, how would he photograph Las Vegas? So a lot of my, a lot of my Las Vegas pictures are in black and white, which are kind of cool or have that, you know, feel to them. And so, uh, yeah, my, some of my Vegas pictures are on there as well. And, and uh, I'm still going out to this day and going out and photographing, um, you know, places in Utah. I'm going back to Las Vegas here pretty soon. So I can't, it's been a couple of years since I've been out there. So, Las Vegas is one of those unique cities that every week the whole landscape changes. So, you know, the downtown, uh, the, the, the canvas is always changing. So I'm always going down there and finding new things to photograph and stuff. And there is, I have a whole uh, graffiti art gallery of Las Vegas spanning 15, 20 years. I used to go to like some of the worst parts of Las Vegas and photograph some amazing graffiti pieces down there. And I should probably share more of that stuff online too. I think people might like to see that. That's really cool, man. I, I love yeah. that imagery of the canvas is always changing. Like that's the that perfect fun. way to look at all of this, I think. Yeah. Is we're all growing, we're all learning, we're all um we're all part of some grand uh performance piece or art exhibition that's yet to be fully uh realized. But I think yeah. we're we're getting there, man. And I'm so happy you did come forward. Um, this, I, I, I'm going to say this on the record. This has been one of my favorite conversations on Somewhere in the Sky since the very oh. beginning. So no, I, um, I got to thank you, man. Like you, you uh, shared a lot with us tonight that you didn't have to. So I truly appreciate that. Yeah. You know, I think I feel like, I'm, like I said, I'm just trying to really close a chapter. And, um, and doing some of these shows helps me talk and vent a little bit. And I don't mean to come across like uh, arrogant or Mr. Know-it-all. And I, I, I'm just, I'm trying to be genuine in, in my approach. And uh, that's, that's kind of really it for me. You know, I, at some point I want to just kind of close this chapter all together and focus on my new stuff that I got going on. Like I'm still going out to the basin and, and I'm still continuing my own data research on my own with other guys too. And, uh, we're finding some really cool stuff. And, and so, and I, I'm, I'm still going back to Skinwalker Ranch occasionally and, and showing them stuff and they're showing me stuff. And, and, uh, yeah, so it's, it's been a real pleasure uh, being able to share time with you and I, I really enjoyed my time here. So thank you for giving me the platform and opportunity to talk a little bit about, uh, my past and, and what I've done. My absolute pleasure. And thank you for your service. Chris. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it.